Okay, we are studying the last session in Colossians. If you, uh, at the beginning of this course, received a book on Colossians, uh, I have not said one word out of that book. <laughs> yeah, there'll be a test on, yeah. There'll be a test on your life as you see if you put this to work in it. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, this is actually within the sharing on Colossians. This is three of three <clears throat> pertaining to the first fruits. And um, so it's going to be the wrap up of the three and it's the wrap up of this particular uh, course in Colossians. Um, so what we're going to do is uh, now just sort of um, go back over the chart, which you, you should somewhat know, um, but the top line represents the feasts of Israel. Maybe I should take this with me. And just like the devil, he doesn't want me to go too far. <clears throat> All right, Passover, First Fruits, Pentecost, Tabernacle. These are four of the feasts and the main ones in that sense. Um, and then underneath that is Jesus' experience. Okay, and so um, was the cross, the resurrection, uh, sending the Spirit, and then the gathering. And so Jesus died on Passover. He was raised on the first fruits. On the Feast of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came. And on the Feast of Tabernacles is the great ingathering harvest at the end of the age. Okay? <clears throat> so, basically, we're just following the, the things out, up and down. All right. So then, the um, uh, I, I put the end time, whatever, but it's from beginning to end. Uh, picture through time is salvation, Christ, receive the Holy Spirit, and then the, the harvest at the end. And then our personal experience, which is being dead with Christ, which is the Passover, which is the cross. Um, <clears throat> um, Christ in you, which is the first fruits of life. Um, the Spirit begins to reveal, and we haven't really dealt a whole lot with that, but I think, I think you've got a basic idea. But that's where between the early rain and the latter rain, um, the Spirit begins to reveal Christ in us and bring forth Him in that manner. Okay, And then the harvest... It's not just that we're saved and everybody's saved is in the big harvest at the end. The harvest is putting on Christ. So, I um, should have brought my Bible out here. Well, anybody have that scripture in James that says, um, be patient, well, I can probably just quote it. Be patient, therefore, brethren. Okay, be patient, therefore, what verse is it? Okay, you can look it up, and I'll see if I can quote it in the King James. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. And when we're talking about the coming of the Lord, we're talking about the Lord being manifested in each and every one of us, and that's the great harvest in the end. So you see that with these, the rest of the words. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. For the farmer hath long patience for that harvest, Till he received the early and the latter rain. Okay, so the first harvest, which is first fruits, which represents Christ, is the um, the result of the early rain. The yeah, the early rain, and the uh, the one at the end time is at the latter rain, and between the the first harvest. And the latter rain harvest, there's a long dry spell. We talked about that. So be patient, therefore, brethren, unto his coming. Okay? And, you know, I mean, you could say that applies to, you know, the end time and all that kind of stuff. All right. <clears throat> so 
That basically is the chart. And um, we've kind of gone, we, we actually went over that a lot more than I thought we would have. Um, but I'd like to read a scripture in Exodus 22. <clears throat> Exodus 22, verse 29 and 30. Now, some of you are going to recognize this scripture from the Thursday night class on which we're talking about the firstborn. What we're going to find out in this scripture that the firstborn and the first fruits is, are exactly the same thing. It's Christ. It's one thing. It's, it's not two separate things. It's just a plant-based version compared to uh, an animal or human because it, it includes all three. This verse does. Okay, 22 verse 29. Thou shalt not delay to offer the first of thy ripe fruits and of thy liquors, uh, the firstborn of thy sons shalt thou give unto me. Okay, so there you've got the first fruits and literally their firstborn son. Likewise shalt thou do with thine firstborn oxen and with the sheep. And so, so you've got all three mentioned in those two verses. And the reason why I'm bringing that up is because you, we spent so much time on the firstborn and that's more in you you need to realize that the first fruits is exactly the same thing except for it has a different angle that it's trying to communicate to us in terms of harvest and what God wants in the end, okay? So Jesus as the firstborn is the firstborn among many brethren. The many brethren is the harvest, okay? And they're in the image of Christ. So we want to talk about that. We want to use a lot of New Testament scriptures to help us sort of grasp some of these things. Um, but one of the things I wrote here was um, <clears throat> the sacrificing of the firstborn uh, is right there with the sacrifice of animals and the produce. To offer them all up is clearly what God is telling them to do. He's telling Israel to offer the firstborn. He's telling Israel to offer the first fruits. In other words, this applies to us. This isn't just something that God wants and it happens. It is something he wants from us. And in the shadow version of the Old Testament, it's from us. In the New Testament version, this is something he wants out of us. Okay. So to the, you know, to the Lord, to the Father, to Jesus, uh, first fruits is not a doctrine. You know, it's not a doctrine. Jesus is the first fruit. Okay, this is as real as real can get with God. If we make it a doctrine, if we make it a teaching, if we make it something that we try to write down and, and only figure it out, but not pursue the heart of the matter, then we're gonna we're gonna miss we're gonna miss any sort of understanding of what the harvest at the end is going to be all about, because it's going to be about the fullness of him who is the first fruit. Remember, all of the harvest that will come is accepted on the basis of the first fruit, which is Christ. So, you know, uh, we, so many angles of that from the scriptures, just, you know, Jesus is the, let me just say it like this, Jesus is the first rock. What does that mean? Well, he's the chief corner stone of all the other rocks, stones, that will be built up to be a habitation of God, okay? So there's, you know, the chief, the, the first fruits is the chief of the harvest, you know? The firstborn is the chief of all Israel and, and everything that counts for anything in the heart of God. So, you know, we, we just, that's, that's this part here, um, the Spirit reveals. And hopefully we'll get to address that a little more when, as we get close to the end of class. But um, how important it is, I mean, how horrible it would be to leave out the Holy Spirit's work from the time Jesus became the first fruit and then in our lives. And then we just, we're, we like come out of Egypt, but we're more like Israel who got deliverance instead of like the firstborn who were given unto God. And I don't want to be that. I don't want to be that. I don't want to think that way. I don't want to think in terms of, of doctrine. I don't want to think in terms of teaching. 
yes, the scripture talk about how shall we hear without a preacher and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, one plants, one waters, but God gives the increase. And so where do you go? You go to him. You go to your heart goes to the Lord. Um, and, you know, a lot of times we get heart wise when we're going through tr trouble. Oh, Lord, you know, <laughs> but what about just I want to be with you. I'd like to just know you. I mean, um, okay, David had a heart after God, right? Okay. He, what, what are identifiable facts of that? Identifiable facts of that would be, Lord, I just want to know this truth. No, that's not, that's not a heart after God. You know, how about if I never know any truth, I want to know you. Someone says, you, well, then you want to know him as the truth. I want to know him. If you can, you can slap a, a title on that. You know, first fruits, slap a title on it and go, I, I want to know you as the first fruits. Well, may the heart of it be, I want to know you. And then it'll be revealed. Him will be revealed. The Spirit of God will do that work during the dry spell. And we'll be gaining toward the harvest time of manifesting Christ instead of, you know, at the end saying, you know, standing before God and saying, ask me anything about the Bible. You know, he's going, dude, the Bible's is no longer valid. Here's the living word of God sitting right here. Do you know him? Thank you, man. Randy, please shut up and don't talk like that. Okay. Amen. I'll go back to doctrine then. Okay, so I'm sorry to get off on this stuff, but I mean, it's like, it's just, you know, that thought of first rock. He's the first rock. He's the first rock. And, and the proof, I shouldn't even be talking about, I need to be finished this, but he's the proof. He's the assurance that there's going to be a temple. Well, that's his body. You know what I'm saying? That's his body. We go, oh, I love you, first rock. <laughs> you know, you know and, and probably saying it like that is better because it moves us more than, he's the chief cornerstone. We go, oh, I know all of that stuff. You know, <laughs> like, like we, we have, I've got so much wisdom in me, I'm, I'm puffy. Anyway, <clears throat> um, all right. So let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. We uh, went over this scripture uh, in one of the previous last two classes, but I want to just do it as a reminder and then move forward into the New Testament scriptures. Okay? 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 20. <clears throat> All right. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. All right. So what he's saying is, you know, he is the first one up, and he is the exact thing that God wanted, all right? He is, so you could say it like this, too. You know, quoting John 12, 24, except the seed fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it dies, it bringeth forth much fruit. He's the first seed to die. Okay, let's say it different. He's the first one to give himself. This is the Father talking. To him. He's the first one to give himself. You see that? That spirit. He loves that heart, that spirit, that way, that selfless. He's the first one to give himself. All right. So if there's a first fruits, is it okay to say, hmm, there's probably going to be a harvest then? Because if it died, it'll bring forth what? Much fruit. That's a harvest. One seed dies, and it doesn't bring forth, well, one seed dies, and it brings forth one seed. <laughs> you know, it brings forth fruit that's full of seeds. All right. So, so the reason why I'm saying all this is I'm trying to get you to see 
a doctrine of this will do nothing on the inside of you. But just like you were, you know, yelling and getting excited about the first rock, well, he's the first fruits, the first seed who gave himself and that came up from that to be able to bring forth more fruit in us now because he made us his body. The proof of the harvest is the first fruits. It's coming. It is. It's coming in you. It's coming in me. But you have to keep looking at him. You have to quit looking at yourself and go, well, what am I going to do? Well, how, do, how shall I know? <laughs> I'm, I'm jumping classes here. I'm <laughs> but, uh, all right. Um, so, um, Jesus is um, resurrection in the first appearing of his life. But as such, he is the first fruits in representation of the rest of his body. He's the first fruit of representation of his body that will eventually wake up of them that slept. So he didn't say they were dead. He said they, they need to be woken up. They're alive because they're, they're born again. They're part of him. But it's more than being born again, for God's sake. It's more than at least our concept of what born again is, which is usually just saved. I'm saved from hell. Um, that will eventually wake up them that slept to his life within them, which is Christ in them, the hope of glory. Okay? Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. So, let's talk about the important ending of all of this, and that is, as it were, the harvest at the end. Uh, even Tabernacles is called the Feast of the End Gathering. You know that, right? So in gathering, gathering, harvest, put on Christ. It's all one. It's all the same thing. Um, but we want to talk about, um, well, let's just read this. Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14, and we'll begin with verse 1. And I looked, and lo, a lamb, a lamb, stood on, the, on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000. Okay, so in the, when I taught the book of Revelation, I showed that the 144,000, everybody goes, oh, well, that's a magic number or something and all this kind of stuff. But really, if you follow it out, in the very beginning of Revelation, there's the Lamb, and he's on the throne, and it's a number that cannot be numbered, and they're worshiping the Lamb, but they're not following the Lamb. And so every time it starts showing the Lamb through the book of Revelation, the number gets so small until at the very end, the only Lamb left is the Bride of Christ, which is many that are one, the wife of the Lamb, wife of the Lamb, one, not many. It's a reducing down until it's just one. This is, this is uh, many stars being sucked into a black hole and being so compacted so tightly that they are one in incredible measure. All right, which I'm sure that's exciting for you to hear me say. But anyway, <laughs> um, a lamb, and with him 144,000, having his father's name. Oh, my God. His father's name, his father's name written on him. Yes. Wow. Uh, in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sang, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000. Uh, which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women. Okay, so we, we look at that and we go, okay, only people that haven't had sex are going, going to be with the lamb. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the way we look at that, okay? But when you die with Christ, that's a completely new beginning. That's a completely re reality that is other than you, it's a reality as known in the heart of God. And some of the things that it'll say after this will we'll bear that out. 
Um, let's see, let me make sure here. All right. Um, these are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. So these are they, these are they of what? These are they that sing a song that nobody else knows. I bet it's about the Lamb. I bet it's the song of the Lamb. You know. And it's a song that you can't sing. And when I say a song, I don't mean a huh. I love the lamb. Sing it with me. I love the lamb. Yeah. No, 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 no. It's got to have a little more something behind it than just we all can, you know, we got a pretty good group here, 144,000. This is going to sound great with harmony. No, it has to be the song of our hearts. Amen. The song of our hearts, for God's sake. Um, they follow the Lamb whithersoever he, he goeth, wherever he goes, wherever he goes. Huh? It's, it has nothing to do with being sent where he tells you to go. Think about it. It has to, it's, you're following him where he goes. It's, a, it's talking about his spirit. <laughs> Some of you are looking at me like, what was that? It's his spirit. You're following his nature. You're following his spirit. And that anywhere that nature goes, you're going to be there with him in that spirit and nature, not just, well, he sent me here, and so I'm going to preach. No. All right. So, these were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God. These are redeemed from among men. Okay, this is taken from among mankind. They're taken from it, and they're virgins now. Do you understand that? Because if it was just, well, never mind. I, can't, I will not say that. Um, verse 5, and in their mouth was found no, oh, I'm sorry. I missed the best part. <laughs> just wanted to see if you're paying attention. And all of you were, wow. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Not to Jesus, not to the Son of God. This is first fruits unto the Lamb, who is the first fruits. This is, this is more than um, this is more than just being saved. This is more than just not going to hell. This is more than just uh, being a Christian and doing Christian things in the earth. This is being first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And he's going, the first fruits, the Lamb, is going, there's my first fruits. See, there's so much in the Bible that talks about his heart. And we're, we go over it and we go, okay, I want to be one of the 144,000. Know? Instead of, I want him to get the first fruits of what his, his selflessness brought to me instead of just getting a saved person. And in their mouth was found no guile for they are without fault before the throne of God. So. You know, every time it uses without guile, this is talking about, and Jesus, you know, what is Isaiah 53, and he opened not his mouth. You know, he was, he was uh, accused, he was slandered, he had false accusers before him, and he opened not his mouth. Okay, well, he's talking about his nature. He's not talking about you know, well, I'm, I'm strong-willed. I, op- I can hold my tongue. You know, we, we want him. See, in this case, we don't just want him to control my life. In this case, we don't want our life. These don't want their life. They want his life, lamb life. Be able to applaud that. <laughs> Praise God. All right. So he wants a lamb harvest. Can I say it like that? 
Once a lamb harvest. All right, so let's go to James chapter 1, verse 18. <clears throat> James 1, 18. I wonder what this verse is going to talk about. I wonder, I wonder. <clears throat> James 1, 18. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a f kind of first fruits of his new creatures. Of, sorry, his creatures. It is his new creatures, right? All right, so by his choice, his own will, he begat us, we're born again, but he did it with the word of truth that he would get something. All of that stuff that we hold as the gospel, you know, being God saving me, he begat in me. He does, he does it with his word, you know, and the truth. He says here that, he did all of that, that we should be a kind of first fruits um, of his creatures. In other words, in his heart, he wants a lamb harvest. Book of Revelation. These are they that follow me anywhere, everywhere. Anywhere is a good word too, isn't it? Anywhere, everywhere. Because anywhere means, hmm, okay, i got to rethink this. <laughs> it's like, I'll follow him everywhere. Will you follow him anywhere? What do you mean by that first? I need to understand. <laughs> you, know, you need to define that, and I'll tell you if I'm for it. Um, so... Uh, let, well, let me just read this. According to this verse, we can not only be part of a great harvest or in gathering, right? This down here, too. Not only be part of a great harvest um, and in gathering at the end of time, but can also be a pattern of him in our time. Pattern of the first fruits. In other words, Though the great fulfillment and ingathering produced by Jesus as the first fruit is yet to be, yet we may still now participate with him as a kind of first fruits in order to be a microcosm of that great event to happen one day. Well, we all, through the three classes we've had, we've all looked forward to the fact that the first fruits gave himself and then came up and that's God's proof that we're all going to come up if we, as long as it's the, the life of the same one and it's all going to happen way down here and it's all going to be this glorious ingathering of all of that but basically what I'm saying is the way these verses are reading like Revelation and James 1.18 and I'll give you some more here in a minute that we can be a part of that right now. And the feeling I got from uh, Revelation 14 was that that 144,000 was that because it wasn't the end of the book of Revelation. So that was like this. That's what I'm saying here, that we are a kind of first fruits to him, to God, and to the Lamb. Wow. Okay. What would it take to, to get to such a place? Well, you know, same thing it took in the scriptures there, to follow the lamb wherever he goes, to, to in any situation, in any whatever. But that doesn't, that's, the, that's actually sort of like the fruit of the lamb. The reality is, is that we say, I want you, and I want you in your nature, not just your healing hand or your blessing hand or your covering or your all the good things that you do for me, I'm willing to bear whatever because of your life and your nature, which again is totally different from any thought we have of bearing anything because we go, I can't bear anything. Well, nobody ever said you could. <laughs> That's why we're, we're offering up the lamb. We're offering up the lamb. What did it say in Genesis when... Noah, they got out of the ark, and it says they built an altar. And he offered up the sacrifices, and it says, uh, 
the sweet savor was a, let's see, what was it? Brought pleasure to God. It's not the exact wording, but it was, and I went, yeah, it was a sweet, but, the, but it brought pleasure to God. And I went, well, what about the death? What about the altar? What about this and that? He said, no, the spirit in which it was given. That's everything. That's sweet to me. The spirit of it, you know. Because, you know, something, you know, you can, you can put a, a pit bulldog on an altar and offer it to God. And <laughs> may not, God might go, I don't know, man. <laughs> I don't think that's a lamb. <clears throat> anyway. Uh, so the pattern can also be worked within us. So the next verse that I want to look at is Romans 16 and verse 5. man. Lord, help me to move along here. Okay, Romans 16, verse 5. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved Epanetus, who is the first fruits of Achaia unto Christ. Okay, several things. We got a first fruits going on in the church. You see that? A big harvest is coming to Achaia. In the future, because we got a first fruits coming up there, right? And he says, "Who is the first fruits of Achaia? Unto Christ, unto the Lamb." So the Lamb is going more first fruits, and not just the harvest of my death. How about uh, more proof? How about First Corinthians sixteen fifteen? You're going to be surprised about who's going to be the first fruits here. 1 Corinthians 16, 15. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. This is, again, the mentioning the first fruits of Achaia. Something is going on there. This is two different books of the Bible. And he's going, this, this group is not just really Christian. They're, they're, you know, they're like super Christians. No, they're not. They're like first fruit. Under Christ. He didn't say, Paul didn't say, you know, they kind of look like first fruits to me. He said, they are first fruits unto Christ. So he's seeing something of that spirit. And I like the fact that he says that, uh, and they, that they have addicted themselves to the ministry to the saints, which is the nature of Christ to pour out to others and not try to build themselves up and to become something. I, I, get, this, I, get, I get that sweet savor that pleases the Father in that scripture. All right. Uh, back to Romans, but Romans 8. Romans 8. All right, so you know that in Romans 8, there is this part where there's this groaning. The whole world groaning, the whole earth, it's all groaning for something. Right? It's all this groaning that's going on here. And so, uh, Romans 8, verse 23 and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. And he's calling, we know what the adoption is, which is uh, Galatians chapter 4, which is someone that's already in the family, and you're an heir, but you're still a child. And he says... The adoption is son placing, but when God, when in God's timing, the Father's timing, He sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your heart, crying, "Abba, Father." This is people that are already believers. This the, the, that was written to the church at Galatia. Okay, so He's moving beyond just save, just you know. He's trying. You can see the Lord. You can see the Lord working through Paul. He's trying to get us to recognize a genuine reality that is in the heart of God in relationship to these feasts, but greater than these feasts, the cross, the 
the coming forth of Christ as first fruits, the, the sending of the Holy Spirit to, from, the, from the ending of the early reign to the ending of the, the latter reign, a harvest that will eventually come forth at the latter reign. And a, har a harvest that can only come forth not as a bunch of individuals, but to wit the redemption of our body. And I see it as becoming his body, therefore his life, therefore his nature. Um, all right, so I wrote down, what does this mean? It means that just as Jesus is the first of the first fruits of the spiritual harvest that will one day be manifest in the church, his body, even so we are sort of like him who have the first fruits of his spirit and nature, who are groaning in anticipation of the harvest of Christ in us to appear fully in our bodies also. That's pretty much just what it says. I mean, you know. Okay. So now, a long paragraph. Therefore, the Feast of First Fruits is not just about the resurrection of Christ, which took place over 2,000 years ago, but also about his resurrection life becoming our resurrection. This is First Fruits talk. This is the way First Fruits talk. It's not just about being resurrected at the end of time. It's about him becoming the resurrection and the life in our to us. The life of first fruits is the same life that will be formed in all believers up to the time of final harvest. With reference to resurrection, it is generally understood that the resurrection of the rest of believers will take place at a latter time after first fruits. However, what must be comprehended is that when we refer to resurrection, we are not merely speaking of dead people getting up or going to heaven. What must be first understood is that the harvest is not primarily about souls that are saved and therefore resurrected after physical death. Instead, we refer to an increase of the life of Christ taking place in believers, his body. So just as Jesus coming forth in resurrection was considered to be the first fruits of the harvest, even so the coming forth of Christ in us will be considered the fruits of harvest that the Father seeks. So I have to read this stuff because I'm not going to get done if I don't read that bad. So what we're saying is that the first, this is the first fruits, which is Christ, right? Okay. The first, which is Jesus of first fruits. The first, he's the first, the meaning of it. The, the full understanding of it, the first has to be brought forth in the harvest in each one so that the, the laying down of the life, the dying, all of that. What did Paul say? Bearing about in my body the dying of the Lord Jesus. He didn't say bearing about the doctrine of dying in my head. Well, amen to that. I'll amen myself. <laughs> so, so, that, so it's the first that counts for the whole harvest. If the first came forth there 2,000 years ago and he said there's going to be a harvest of this kind, then he's going to come forth in me. You're supposed to go, praise God, I can believe that. I w I'm with you. I believe that. I want that. I desire that. And where do, you, where do you look to find that? You look in your own sorry life. No. <laughs> no. That's the last place you look. You look at the first. Because he's also going to be the life that comes forth in you. So what is he thinking? 
the Father wants a harvest. He doesn't just want the first fruit. He already had me. But he wants a harvest, an ingathering of all that that is of this same seed that has gone into death and come forth, and now it's his life. All right, so the feasts have, have direct application to our, to our own spiritual experience. Because of our oneness with him in his crucifixion and resurrection 2,000 years ago, as well as Christ being worked into our existence at this time. So that means that the working going on by the Holy Spirit that was sent after first fruits happened, then 50 days later the Holy Spirit came. 40 of these first fruit days was Jesus showing up to people. Did you know that? 40 of it was there. So they only had a 10-day gap when there wasn't Jesus or the Holy Spirit right there. <laughs> I mean, I love that. I mean, I'd be freaking out for 10 days, but I'd, you know. <laughs> but, you know, nonetheless, one or the other is here, and I'm going, yeah, yeah. You know, so now Jesus went away. Jesus of Nazareth went away. Now it's Jesus the first fruits that I love and that I worship and that I see that as everything God wants in me and in his own heart. Um, all right, so the final harvest of the coming forth of Christ being formed in his body is something the whole creation groans for. That's Romans 8, 19. And then comes the ingathering. See, then comes the ingathering. So I was thinking about this, and this was just a statement I wrote down because I began to try to um, grasp, not, not mentally, but certain things that I've heard said. So I wrote down, the wolf shall lay down with the lamb, because you know, it, it doesn't say that the lion shall lay down with the lamb. Y'all know that? Everybody know that? It does, that's not what it says. Okay. <laughs> you know, everybody quotes that, and you have little figurines with a, the lamb and the lion, and there's no scripture that directly says that. And, uh, and you're not going to hell if you have one. <laughs> Kelly. No, no, no. <laughs> but the wolf shall lay down with the lamb. And then I wrote down, they will lay on an altar together and become lamb in spirit. That'd be a harvest. Because we'd be the wolf. <laughs> You know, but it'd only be wolf's clothing because now we would have the lamb in us. <laughs> Did you ever think of it like that? And, of course, lay down, my mind immediately goes to the altar. It goes to Isaac laying down on the altar. It goes to, you know, Jesus laying down his life. It goes to that truth of laying down, not just... Oh, let's just lay on a bed here and be comfy. You know? <clears throat> All right. So we're getting close on both fronts. Look at us. All right. So let's talk about the work of the Holy Spirit in first fruits. And we've, we've talked about it basically. But in our chart, the main, you know, the, the, that comes with the Feast of Pentecost. Okay. And Pentecost was, as I said, 50 days after the first fruits, but the first fruit was walking around 40 of those days. Right, Mallory? You're looking? Okay. Just making sure. Yeah. So you had Pentecost, which is in Jesus' situation, there was the cross, resurrection, and then the sending of the Holy Spirit, okay, which was 50 days after first fruits. And, um, and then in the, the larger picture, you have the fact of us receiving the Holy Spirit. Now, the receiving of the Holy Spirit should have been more than just being able to have gifts of the Spirit or speak in tongues. And, and you know, everyone who knows me knows I have no problem with that. Well, maybe I can say I have a problem with it if that becomes greater than him revealing Christ. If that becomes greater, you know. Paul said, I would that you all speak in tongues. Me too, okay? I'm not against you. But I'm just saying. 
the purpose of the Holy Spirit was to come after this feast and start revealing Christ. This, we got to get the seed in all these people. We got to get it growing there. We got to water it. Some, some planted some water, but God gives the increase, you know? Remember the scriptures? And so he's, he's like, I'm here and I'm doing my job now. And my job is that Christ will come forth in his body. And they'll be at the end. And I'm going to do it from the end of uh, first fruits or the end of the early rain till the latter rain starts. And it all starts popping up everywhere. So, so the sending of the Holy Spirit had harvest in mind, had the ingathering in mind. It had Christ in mind. The Holy Spirit has Christ in mind. When he comes, he will not speak of himself. He will declare me. He will take that which is mine and show it unto you. He will glorify me. Well, what better way than to fulfill the feasts? What better way than to feel, fulfill Jesus' part in the true reality of the feast, the cross, the resurrection, the Holy Spirit coming, and then there being a great ingathering? What better way? Then in our life, where the Spirit begins to reveal, I mean, we, come, we, we are dead with Christ, whether we all know it or not. Um, Christ is in you if you're born again, but the Spirit of God wants it to. He wants to move in such a way that, that we put on Christ, that it's not us being Christian, but Christ is the fulfillment of Christianity. How weird is that? <laughs> I mean, that's a weird way to say it. That's the truth. He's the fulfillment of Christianity. Yes. And when you fulfill something, you don't need that anymore. Now, I'm not saying we don't need to. I know. Crucify me, crucify me. But what I am saying is I'd like to see more Christ and less Christians. Is that okay? Still love me? <laughs> okay. So, uh, so, well, let's do this now. See, I, I thought I was getting close and I'm talking too much. All right, so the work of the Spirit in first fruits. The new creation began with the resurrection of Christ. The new creation began. I mean, that, not everybody will understand that, but the new creation actually, because we, we were put to death with him and we were raised up with him and made to sit together in heavenly places before the Spirit ever came. Because of first fruits. It's, just, it's all in him. It's just a matter of manifestation now. All right. So uh, the new creation began with the resurrection of Christ. He is the first fruits of the new creation. The church began, the church began with the coming of the Holy Spirit on the Feast of Pentecost. Do you agree with that? Well, if you don't, you need to check it out scripturally because that's when on the Feast of Pentecost the Holy Spirit came and that's when everything began to change because they began to understand things in a completely different light than we're 12 disciples of a guy who's going to be the Messiah and he's going to rule over Israel and we're going to be, we're going to be the happy Jews, you know. But reality starts coming in reality of, of what God is really doing, that, folks, that only comes by the Holy Spirit coming. Okay, so, um, well, so through the Holy Spirit, we shall be made aware of this, uh, of the first fruits, but that we're his body. We're the, we're the body of the first fruit. Oh, that's more than Christian. That's more than uh, I want to plug in to the first fruits. The, and when I say the first fruits, I mean the first of the first fruits. I mean him. Okay. Not the concept. I mean <laughs> but the first. Um, so... Um, And then I, I wrote that we become aware of the new man, Jesus, and not the old man. Get, get ready. We become aware of the new man, Jesus, the, f the first of the first fruit, not the old man, 
Jesus of Nazareth. All right. New stuff for some of you. It's easy to explain in one minute. Um, Jesus of Nazareth, we, we, we're not his body. In fact, I'm going to tell you something devastating. He died. Yeah. And there was a resurrection, but it wasn't of Jesus of Nazareth. It was of the new man of whom we are his body. And the concept of Jesus radically changed at the cross and at the resurrection. Okay. So, you know, so we're not little disciples following Jesus of Nazareth around. You know, that's not, that's not who we are. We are, you know, we're not going, oh, Jesus, touch me, touch me. You know, we are his hands. We are his feet. We are the vehicle of the living Christ, all right, which is way different than Jesus of Nazareth. So let me just encourage you to let him die yeah. and let the new, new be revealed by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> all right the first had to go away that the new may come by the Holy Spirit and Jesus knew that he said I got to go away no you don't no no don't leave us you're the best teacher no there's a better teacher because he's going to teach you the real me the eternal me not the earthbound one that you've known for how long that you've really really known the depths of Jesus of Nazareth, me? Oh, three and a half years? Well, you're the rock of Gibraltar, guys. You know, no, that's, you know, you need to just forget all of that now and start really coming into understanding me by the Spirit. All right. So Jesus would not declare himself, right? Because he said, I have many things to say unto you, but I cannot say them now. And he wanted to declare things of him and of his of the reality of who he is apart from the Nazarene that they knew. And he said, but I, I, I can't. I have to go away and let him declare. Cause why? Because he won't declare himself. It's his nature. It's his spirit. He will not declare himself like that. Um, so, oh, and he wouldn't declare himself because why? He came to declare the Father. And what did he do? A darn good job of declaring the Father. Okay? So now the Holy Spirit will introduce us to uh, Jesus on a whole new basis. God has accepted Christ as first fruits that represent the fact that in his mind, in God's mind, we are Jesus' body. Though not fully formed yet, the Spirit will come, Feast of Ta uh, Pentecost, to bring us to that image. As soon as Christ is formed in every part, the harvest will be gathered, tabernacles, the ingathering. Right now, our life is hid with Christ in God. But he, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will begin to reveal. All right. So when I say right now, I mean, I'm sure anyone who is truly coming to a revelation of Christ, they're in this process because you're being brought into what is more than you're being brought into what needs to be. He is your life. He is. You know, and everything that is of him is yours. He is your righteousness. So stop it. You know, just get off the religious bandwagon and say, I just want Jesus because it all comes with him. And when you see him, then you see all of those things as him. And you say, thank you, Jesus. Can I hug you? And he'll go, sure, come on. Um, okay, so. Whew, I am. All right, 
just this one last little part, I think. Um, remember uh, in the firstborn class I talked about two, two groups coming out of the exodus remember that one of the groups was Israel and the other group was the firstborn and there was a clear cut reality of that reality that I'd never heard anywhere before when I saw it I was like whoa but it was it's undeniable in the scriptures and it carries on out and so uh, in, a, in a sense, may I say, with the first fruits, there can be those who are delivered and saved. But God wants the first of the first fruits coming out in the end gathering. Okay? So I'm not sure how this is worded, but this is the last part. Yeah, good. We need to be mindful, just as God wanted the firstborn of Israel to be mindful, that we belong to God. So remember, the firstborn belonged to God. And they belong to God to be sacrificed, if you will. You remember that? First fruits is the same thing, folks. Okay? So we need to be mindful, just as God wanted the firstborn of Israel to be, uh, to be mindful, that we belong to God in a special way other than just being saved from Egypt. Israel only got deliverance, but the firstborn stood before God as his sacrificial son. All right, so um, you, see, you see that there can be a harvest that is not fully his life coming forth, but the first fruits died for that and rose again to stand on their behalf. But you can see that to be the first fruits or the firstborn is not, um, which we talk about this all the time, but is not an exclusive group. It's not exclusive. That group is not only not exclusive, it's dead. It has embraced the death with Christ so that Christ would be their life. So you can't be exclusive and alive. <clears throat> or I mean dead. You can be exclusive and alive. Well, I'm, we're special. We're a special group. Then you're, you're not. No, you're not. You're not even in that group. Because <laughs> you're not dead. <laughs> right? The, the very way that you talk proves that you're not there that's you know that's not christ talking in you and that's not him being formed in you um <clears throat> so christ crucified is the definition of what it means to belong to god and to his purposes in relationship to firstborn and first fruits okay so when paul's saying hey so-and-so is the looks like the first fruits of achaia and you know and starts talking about stuff like that he's literally seeing that which is laying down its life that Christ may live, that my, Christ may come forth. He's seeing the same thing of the first fruits being reenacted in him and in this place that they're at. Because he's not just the first fruit, he's a, uh, he's the, and he's not just the first fruits under Christ or under the Lamb. He's the first fruits of Achaia. That's why I said it looks like there might be a big harvest coming there. You see that? So he's, he's you know, this guy and, and the people of Achaia, they are, they are moving toward this reality now. They want it in them now. They want to be that to, to the Lord and, and they want to be that to uh, uh, Achaia they, they want to see an increase of Christ instead of an increase of Christianity. All right. So, Christ crucified is the definition of what it means to belong to God and to his purposes. Fruit happens with maturity. And as with becoming a firstborn son, which is first fruits, like Isaac or Jacob, maturity is when the son comes forth out of our death. Uh, Israel came out there was they had no intention they just wanted deliverance look at them in the wilderness every time they got in a hard time all they wanted was deliverance you know and that's okay I mean God's okay with that in the sense of they were still his people still his people 
in that sense. Um, but God wants his son. And that is an eternal fact that will never change. So I don't know how it all works out in, uh, in the harvest and everything because I only see it in relationship to, I think, the way I see the feasts. And I only see it in relationship to the way I see Jesus' death and everything that he died for. And I only see that in, like, the way I preach Christ crucified, that it is... I see that he, he wants his son and, he, and that, that uh, his method for gaining that is the altar, is the cross, is the cross. So, you know, that's why I preach it hard and fast and I never, I never think once concerning being exclusive. I don't. I think in terms of if, you're, if, you're, if you choose this path, you're saying, I must decrease, not I must get greater and be really exclusive. I must decrease, and he must increase. Okay. Well, that's the definition of the great ingathering. <laughs> that's it. That which is us is like chaff that has to fall away so that the seed can come forth. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for Kelly's class coming up. Bless it. May the word richly flow, and may it be life unto each and every one that hears it, not just in this room, but uh, that are listening on Skype and that will listen to these sharings years to come. May all that we do in this place be to your glory and honor by Christ Jesus. We love you. We love you, Father. We love your Son. We love the Holy Spirit. So in his name we ask it. Amen.